100. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. So I'm uh, Peter Eisentraut, uh, Postgres developer with EDB, longtime contributor to Postgres hacking. And today I want to talk about a topic that is sort of an ongoing research of mine and, and something I've been thinking about and working on for some years now. And I want to sort of explore that, that uh, topic and present some, well, challenges, ideas, uh, may maybe leave with more questions than answers, but uh, we'll see. So he this is a sort of starting slide I like to use whenever I talk about encryption related topics. Why do we even encrypt? The first one is obvious. That's usually the starting point. You, you know, have data, you want to keep it confidential, protect it, encrypt it so other people can't read it. That's, that's pretty obvious. The second one is sometimes forgotten or, or not obvious that it goes together that you want to maintain data integrity so that so even if you encrypt, it translates your data into some bits that a, an adversary or, or someone who's not supposed to read it can't read it, but someone can still go in and change the bits. And then the data is falsified. And so that they, kind of, they still can't read your data, but they can sort of make a mess of what you're doing. So you want to arguably protect against that. And if you think about sort of SSL, that's well understood, right? You have that sort of goes together. You have the, you know, the signing of things, but also the encryption, usually those go together, but it's not always sort of guaranteed that those come together. So those are the main ones, but then there's other things. So crypto shredding is a thing that uh, people sometimes think about. Uh, and what that means, if you've never heard of that, is you might have requirements to at some point delete data. This is very common, right? You have either you have your own policies or obviously at some point you run out of disk space or you have regular requirements that after three months or after seven years or whatever, you have to delete some data. How do you actually do that? If you, if you think about this, it's actually quite difficult to really delete data. If you just delete something in Postgres, we know that's actually not even deleted. It's just marked as invalid. And then vacuum kind of cleans that up, but not really. And it just sort of marks it for reuse. And then even the file system doesn't actually delete it. It's very hard to actually delete anything, right? So the crypto shredding approach is that if you encrypt it and you throw away the key, then it's gone. And that's a, a sort of an approved approach to do that, right? So that's a good use case. And then in practice, the most important one is some regulations and policies require you to encrypt things. And that's often, in, in my sort of practical experience, the, the most important one. That, yes, there are these technical reasons of, like, for these reasons we do that, and then that informs policies, regulations, laws. And in my practical work, you know, sometimes we talk to customers or evaluate what, what do you really want, and then we talk about it afterwards in the team, maybe. So what are they actually trying to do here? What is their adversary? as we talk about in, in these kinds of things. What, what are they defending against? What's their adversary? And then I like to joke, well, their adversary is their internal auditor. And, and that's sort of a joke, but it's in practice true. Right? If you talk to sort of the tech people and the tech people say, we need some encryption, how can we, what do you have? And they just have to do that because their security team or GDPR or whatever told them to do it. And then that's the end of that, right? And then finally, defense in depth is always good. Right? No single security measure protects against everything. It's hopefully clear. So if you build more things on top of each other, you have you know, basic things like physical access controls, firewalls, you know, passwords, you know, all kinds of things. Encryption, you know, auditing, all those things. None of these is like the, the one solution, but if you stack them on on top of each other, one of those breaks or gets somehow compromised or is sort of done incorrectly, you have more protection, if that makes sense. So think about all of these as we go through some of the, the scenarios and use cases. It's not only the first one, right? 
All right, so different, uh, so split, uh, split up what kind of encryption is relevant in a database. I mentioned SSL is hopefully obvious at this point. It's pretty well established and solved. So that's, that's, that's a different talk. <laughs> encryption at risk, what we in Postgres land now call TDE is a thing that people want to do. And that's also a different talk, potentially. The thing I want to talk about is the third one. And so as you know, some of you know, EDB, as other, other Postgres vendors have a TDE solution, and you know, sometimes I get pulled into discussions with customers on evaluating what do they want, right? And my experience has been in a lot of these cases, up to half of these cases, I would say, is they don't really want TDE or encryption at risk. If you really listen to what, what, what do you do, what is your thinking, what they really want is some kind of solution that effectively encrypts the data on the client somehow so that it doesn't even end up on the database server in plain text. That's what people are thinking. And so that's what I want to explore. This comes with different names. You can call it client-side encryption. That sort of implies that other different vendors call it column encryption. That's sort of the title of my talk, but also the title of sort of how I call it. Other database systems that don't have columns, they have field, they call it field, encry field encryption. You, you will see these kinds of terms. You have to be careful if you look at under, other vendors, other products, the terminology of, of all of this varies. So for example, in Postgres, the ecosystem we call you know have a thing called TDE that's that one thing and then I'm talking today about column encryption or client side column encryption that's the other thing. In for example Microsoft SQL Server land, what they call TDE is all encryption basically, and then under TDE you have you know encryption at rest, column encryption, maybe other things, but they all call those TDE right so. The terminology is sometimes different. You have to be careful if you compare this to other products. So I mentioned standards and regulations. Uh, it's very important, and there's a bunch of those. I picked up a couple because those are e easy to understand, easy to understand. There's a, you know, all of you have probably seen all these acronyms in, in practice. The, the important thing to take away is they all apply in different scenarios. So PCI DSS is for credit cards. GDPR, of course, well known here. FIPS is something that the US government uses. HIPAA is for medical data in the US. And so it depends on what you do. What is your business, right? If you're a payment credit card processor in Europe, then yeah, the first two apply to you. If you're doing dealing with health data in the US, then maybe the, the third and the fourth apply to you. If you are, you know, doing both or, or you know, you're in the US taking credit cards, maybe it's FIPS and, and PCI and so on. Oftentimes you don't think about that too much because you know, if you use SSL, it's just fine. It just does its thing. Maybe you turn on FIPS mode in your operating system and then somehow you're happier. But if we're, as we're gonna go through this, this is sort of important because in the space I'm talking about, there's not really one solution that satisfies all of these. And that makes it a little trickier. All right, so this is the basic scenario that I want to achieve, that you have some client application that has some secret data. Let's use sort of credit card numbers as a motivating example here. That's usually easy to think about. That's what PCI DSS required. If basically, if you have a credit card number, you have to encrypt it. That's what it says in there, so you have to do that. So. If you, if you have that here, ideally you want to have that encrypted here, but you also you, you want to have it encrypted before it even gets there, right? So it's already sort of encrypted on the wire. That's the basic idea of what I want to get to. How could we do that? And the other thing is like you don't encrypt everything. You only encrypt certain columns, right? The credit card number, let's say, but some other stuff you don't necessarily encrypt. So why, why, why do this kind of, why do column encryption, client-side column encryption? Alternative would be, for example, you put all the secret stuff in a different database. And you protect that even, even more, even better, right? You keep all your sort of normal data here and maybe the important data there. 
other motivating example, for example, is medical data. You can say like, well, you have your normal database stuff in one database and then all the sort of critical sort of sensitive medical stuff in another database. You could do that, but then you lose the integrity between the data, the usual things, right? Referential integrity, the transactional consistencies, consistent backups and so on. Then you have two different things that are just doing their own thing and you have to somehow figure, uh, figure out how to keep them consistent. So if you keep them all in one database, better, arguably, right? You can arrange it so that only some clients have certain keys so that only they can access certain, certain data. That's kind of useful. One thing that actually people keep asking me, I, I didn't really realize that the third point initially, but people keep asking me about this sort of in this context that we, we can more easily take production data, move it to staging or testing, for example, and have sort of certain data automatically hidden or move data to analytics without having to worry about leaking data, maybe that shouldn't be there. I'm not sure if that, you know, obviously this needs more thinking to make sure you're doing it exactly right, but it seems to be use case that people are interested in. And then just general sort of accidental leakage into backups, logs, stuff like that. If it's encrypted, if it's, ne if it's always encrypted before it even gets to the server, the server can't leak it, so. So I'm gonna have sort of various slides of pros and cons. Uh, so I'll start with this one. I think this is actual security, right? Some, you could argue, argue that stuff like TDE is useful, but it is a bit you know, compliance theater. This does give you security as I think I've explained, right? If the data is encrypted before it even gets on the server, then it's assuming you do all the other things right, that's real security, but it is hard to do as I will explain. First solution you will find today, if you look for this kind of thing, you will find various vendors and products that do this in a proxy. And that seems to work, right? So it looks like you have some other product here in the middle. Those, these are usually, or these are all commercial products, so they will explain this to you and say, it's all great. You just hook this, install this, you hook this up, it's fully transparent. It looks like a database server, it does things, and then it's encrypted on the outside. All right. Those kind of things exist. You can use those today. The, the, the obvious question is here, what, is, what are the question marks, right? What, what do these things do? These are proprietary products. They will give you a list of all their certifications and compliances. I'm sure they're doing a reasonable job, but and they will give you obviously some technical information and data sheets, but it's sort of, well, it's, it is what it is, right? So you can trust those. It is obviously easy to deploy if you believe their claims, but it is an additional third party proprietary thing. You will have to rely on them for, you know, that they're doing a good job now, but also longevity obviously. And so, but, Okay, that exists. And a lot of these also work with databases other than Postgres. So I think I can name one. I have no relationship with them, but they sponsored a Postgres conference recently, baffle.io. Maybe that's a name that some of you have heard, just to give you an example of this. All right. The second thing, and this is what probably in practice everybody does, it's somehow now if they need to do that you do it just in the client you have some i have some example python code here so how you could do that right you have your just normal python code and then okay i need to encrypt something then i'm going to go to somewhere uh -huh, right get some encryption library obviously those exist i need to get the key from somewhere that's also <laughs> obviously a big question here and then i just encrypt stuff here okay there's details omitted here, but you can do that, right? So again, credit card example here, you have the name. I looked up Maria as the most common name in Greece. That's why I'm using that in the examples. Um, and then you just encrypt it and you can decrypt it down here. So you know, that works. Obviously, <laughs> there's a lot of details to work out, but that's kind of the starting point, right? So yeah, pros, you can do it now with code, uh, with you know facilities that exist, but you have to do all the work yourself. 
and you have to be very careful to do it all correctly, as I will explain in the rest of the time here. And and you have to keep your code all in sync with your database, right? There's no connection between the two. You just have to make sure you do it right. That you know the next developer who comes on board doesn't accidentally not do that. Right? There's no way to like enforce that, or you just have to be very very careful. So this is okay for maybe sort of a limited scope, but not something that's reasonable to roll out across you know a large organization and sort of keep everybody in sync that way. So. This is sort of an important thing to think about that you, if you want to do client side encryption, you have to use parameters in your queries so that you separate the actual query from the data so that the client library or whoever does it knows what the data is and what the query is. Otherwise, it doesn't know that, right? So if you just do, you sort of do the first thing, you put that into your Elliptic queue or in your driver, the driver doesn't know what the data is, right? It's just a string. This is well understood, obviously, SQL injection and so on and so on and so on, but you have to do that, right, just so we're clear. So that the, the driver then knows how you, there's a parameter that corresponds to something I need to encrypt, and I encrypt it and pass the parameter on separately. That's important. Otherwise, you just leak the data. Um, if you, so this is the encrypted columns here, the non encrypted columns, you can do whatever you want, it doesn't matter, right? The other question that comes up, obviously, is when I encrypt things in the client, the database doesn't know what it is. Can I still use it in the database as normal? Well, no, because it doesn't know what it is. Again, first, first example there, if you just send a, a predicate with an unencrypted value, then that's bad. You're just leaking it. You've got to use parameters. Does the second thing work? Can you do that? If you, let's say, again, let's data here, let's call it credit card number. Can I look up a credit card number if it's encrypted? Maybe, we'll talk about that later. But complex operations like that probably won't work. Right? If you want to do sort of range comparisons or substrings on stuff that's encrypted, it's not going to work because the database doesn't know that. Some of these things will tell you that that works. And that's always very question mark, question mark, question mark in my mind. And in some cases, I dug into this of how do they do that. And what actually happens is they then just decrypt it over here and sort of on the fly and then do the operation and then re-encrypt it. And so it's kind of cheating in a way, I think. So this kind of stuff you have to be very mindful of. They promise you this all works, no restrictions. Very dubious. All right, speaking of dubious things. Uh, whenever you look for something to do with encryption in Postgres, you will find PG Crypto. Uh, PG Crypto is almost never the right answer in any of these cases, but I just want to motivate why. So you could do, you will see these kind of recipes and blog posts and things like that, right? So yeah, we have an encrypt function. It's literally called encrypt in PG Crypto, so you can do this kind of thing. And then you have it encrypted. Right? There's obviously sort of a big key here, right? Where do you get that one from? You could do things like this, that you get the key from a file, so at least it's not here in plain text, or you could you know, obviously plug in any other function to get the key from somewhere. So that's maybe okay, at least to address that particular problem. The other problem, those of you who are in the know of, of all these abbreviations and acronyms that PG Crypto only supports CBC encryption, which is uh, quite obsolete nowadays. So it's just bad in that respect. So pros, yes, PG Crypto is available everywhere. You can do it. You can centralize in the database. It doesn't require a lot of code. So it does work. This kind of stuff, it does work. But it, I don't think it really satisfies the requirements, right? It's not client-side encryption to begin with. But you can use it sort of as a mini TDE, I guess, if you want. You can hide it in view, so maybe it's not actually that bad. Maybe you can hide this kind of thing in an updatable view that will probably also work. But there's no key management, as I alluded to, and the cryptography is antiquated, so that's not going to pass any requ any regulatory requirements. So even if you think this is sort of structurally okay, the cryptography is not going to pass requirements. So we'll talk a little bit about the cryptography in a minute, but just to warn you, it's not going to work. 
This is a nice solution in, this is just an, Django is just an example, but oftentimes if you use some kind of framework or ORM or, you know, libraries, things like that, they oftentimes have these kinds of facilities built in. So here's an example from, from Django that seems to be quite popular that you, you know, it literally looks like that. You have your model and you just say like encrypt this. And then under the hood, it does all these things like I showed in the Python code previously, presumably, right? So this is quite nice. If, if you, you know, obviously you have to then only use this framework, but if you have sort of a limited application that's really sensitive and you, you just wanna, that that's all that you need, then I think that's a good solution, right? So, but you have to be also careful, especially if you, well, if you just, you, you know, again, Google my framework, column encryption, you will find all kinds of blog posts and plugins, but oftentimes they're actually just PG crypto wrappers underneath. And then you have that same problem. So I think this one here, this specific one, you know, I'm not personally endorsing that, but this seems to be a quite reasonable and popular one as far as I could tell, but just very similar other, you know, Django cryptography, slight different version of those words. There are other plugins that do it wrongly. So be careful to find the right one. And, and, and especially if you're looking for this one. All right. All right. So now, um, any questions so far on, on, on this so far? Okay. So Let's talk a bit, a little bit about these details on encryption because that's important in this case. So, you know, you, so I had some of these examples up here. Some of you will have heard of all of these things. You have to worry about sort of different ciphers and modes and keys and, and all these kind of things. And ideally you don't want to think about those, right? Because not everybody should have to learn those things. We saw that, for example, the Django example kind of, you know, hit that away quite nicely. The PG crypto example, and uh, for example, didn't because you had to li literally manually specify the encryption mode. And there's a couple other things you have to think about. So let's kind of dive into those things. So the, the first thing to think about is, I alluded to some of these issues. Uh, when you want to look up, I had the example earlier, you want to look up a, a credit card number that's encrypted, for example, right? So you, that could work. You encrypt the search. The thing you want to search for, you encrypt it in the client. You send it, you put, pack it up as a parameter for your select query. You send it up. It seems that that should work, but it might not. Because there's you, you, you might think when you encrypt the thing again, it should give you the same encrypted output. That's basically what encryption does, right? It permutes some bits into another string of bits, and it's the same one every time. And that is true, but in practice, that's not secure, or not as secure as we would like. So what you see in practice is that encryption usually has some randomization mixed in so that the output is different every time. So this is the first example. You encrypt foo a few times, and it gives you a different result every time. Obviously, the decryption gives you foo back every time, but the encryption has a different output every time. And this is good. Let's think about a medical database, for example, as, another, as, as, as an example again. Let's say you somehow get access to that table. Obviously, that's the first step. But let's say you get access to that table somehow. You see plain text names and then encrypted diagnosis or something like that, something sensitive. And you don't see what it is, but you see that the same bit string there occurs many times. And you can draw conclusions from that. But well, first of all, you can tell that that guy has the same diagnosis as that guy. That's already information. You can see that 33% of all the people who went to this hospital have that diagnosis. You don't know what it is. But you can kind of guess at that point, right? Because you kind of know what kind of hospital it is and, and so on and so on, right? So that is really bad. And so that's why by default, you should, should use randomized encryption for these use cases. Because otherwise, 
uncertainty. So you can't reverse engineer through sort of statistical analysis what the data is. But at that point, you can't do any more lookups. It just doesn't work. I think on, on the other hand, on the credit card example, I think that's fine because usually one person only has one credit card and it's not that interesting. You just don't want to know what the exact number is, but there's no sort of statistics you can draw from comparing that. So this is a kind of a trade-off you just have to do yourself. Using that kind of, I mean, that's already a hard thing you have to think about, but you have to think about that kind of thing. And the, the, the third variant of that is that you will often see in, in, in connection with this topic is homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic is, you know, obviously Greek uh, means same shape, basically. So that's encryption that results in the same shape. That's the, the basic idea. So this could mean, this could have various different shapes. Of you could have, you know, if you encrypt a string, you get a string. If you encrypt a number, you get a number. Or there are sort of certain homomorphic encryptions that preserve certain properties, so that maybe you could concatenate things, and it, the result is sort of the same as if you concatenated the plain text. There's order preserving encryption, so that even if it's encrypted, the order is the same and so on. This all seems very appealing because it also solves these problems earlier that, you know, I can't do any computations with my encrypted stuff in the database. This is notionally the solution for that. But my advice is this is all very bad because it basically all of these are somewhat insecure in various ways. And they also not pass any regulations, right? So this is you know, it sounds appealing, and I'm sure the people and the researchers who, you know, worked on these, they, you know, did a fine job. But in practice, you know, for the, considering the initial use cases that we set out, this is not appropriate. Consider, for example, the order-preserving encryption. This is apparently a thing that people want to do that doesn't make any sense, right? So you have, you know, you encrypt uh, you know, maybe a, a name call, you have a plain text name column and then a salary that you encrypt. If you have order preserving encryption, you can still see like sort of where in your tiers someone's salary is that leaks information, but it's not allowed. So be very careful about that. The other thing you have to think about is padding or lack thereof. So if you have strings of different lengths, then the encryption result by default is going to have different lengths as well. That can also leak information. Again, think about sort of medical databases or things like that, right? You can sort of say, well, all the strings are like this. They seem to be kind of the same length that leaks the same kind of information as I said before, right? If you encrypt the credit card number, it's not so much of a problem because they're all the same length, plus or minus one maybe. This seems to be a very hard problem to solve. What you can do and what some methods do by default is pad things to 16 bytes uh, of the encryption blocks. But that's just about everything you can do. You could say, okay, I know all my strings are at most 1,000 characters, so I pad everything to 1,000 characters. You could do that. That's okay. Obviously, it wastes space, but if you need to do that, you can do that. But what maybe you're thinking, well, I just add some random padding, right? Every string, I add a random amount of padding. People have had that idea before, that's not secure, right? You can do statistical analysis on that to break that. So this seems to be an actually sort of genuinely unsolved problem in, crypto in cryptography. So if that's a problem for your use case, then this is, you have to think about how to, how to address that. And this is the uh, kind of thing I, as the implementer, stare about and where I'm kind of stuck, like what actual encryption mode do you use? And there's all these requirements, right? So ideally you want your encryption mode to be some kind of standard, maybe an RFC or something like that. Not all of them are, you know, there's many RFCs, but some of them are or not. You want to maybe address the padding issue we just talked about. There's also a thing called nonce reuse. This is maybe gets too far, but in in some in, or many encryption mode, in order to do this sort of randomization, you need to feed in a, a nonce or an initialization vector. But since you would 
you have different clients, they are not connected to each other, there's a chance that maybe they use the same nonce at some point randomly, and that's in some cases very bad. So this is kind of, you, you want to use, you want to have something that is, has nonce reuse resistance, that's, that's what that column says. You want to have the integrity support that we talked about at the very beginning, probably. Maybe depending on your regular requirements, you, you need FIPS support. And ideally, if you want to implement any of this, might be good that it's in some library you could use, right? So maybe in Postgres context, it would be nice if whatever one chooses is maybe in OpenSSL or also in other you know, popular client libraries like um, you know, JDK. And so if you look through here, ideally you want to have yes here everywhere, but there are none, right? <laughs> and so that's kind of the problem. It's sort of a problem. One is like, as an implementer, what do you do? But the other thing is also, if you want to present this to sort of users, you can't just hand them this sheet and say good luck, right? So this is a real challenge and there is no real solution. I can tell you, so my favorites, let's say, are the, the first one. Um, and that one seems fine, except it has a no in the standard column. And so that's what some people will complain about. And the fourth one, AES JCM Civ is, that seems to be the one that's sort of the right thing for this. But you will see sort of toward the end there, it's only implemented in OpenSSL 3.2, which is very recent. So a lot of people wouldn't be able to use that. And also it doesn't have any, it's not, it, it had, there are Java implementations of this, but they're not in the standard JDK. So I mean, if you were to implement something like this in the JWC driver, maybe that we'd have to pull in some third party library that does also doesn't seem very appealing. So this is kind of where we're stuck at the moment. And then the last one is obviously also always a good one. Uh, I, I see, the, you know, just make your own. I, I've, I've seen this also, people actually generally, generally do this in these contexts that they take one of these here and say, well, this one is actually pretty good, but it doesn't have FIPS compliance. So I made my own change and now it's FIPS compliant. So people do that kind of stuff. Maybe not something you should do if, if you don't have the really, really deep knowledge of this, but this kind of stuff happens. All right, so this was sort of the interlude and now I want to show a couple more solutions. Um, PG Sodium is sort of an, a more modern alternative to PG Crypto. So Lip Sodium is a is an encryption library, just a general one, and then PG Sodium is a Postgres wrapper around that. And so you could, and it, it has. I mean, PG Sodium itself just has also encryption primitives, but it also has this column encryption support, which kind of looks like that. It's very deep and very well thought out. So that might be something to look into. So you could, you know, it looks kind of like that. And you just make a key here somewhere first, and then you just create your table. Normally you notice there's nothing special here. And then it, you, it, you kind of use this security labels here as a, a trick maybe, or a way to do that. It has its own sort of sub language in here in the label. And then it just all does all kinds of things in the background, use, you know, sets up views and event triggers and all kinds of stuff. And then it just happens. So that is, seems pretty cool and pretty sophisticated. So maybe that's something to look into. So advantages, PG, uh, PG sodium and lip sodium is much more modern than something like that PG crypto would offer. And this is all also very transparent to the client code. As I mentioned, it uses triggers and views and things like that. PG sodium is a third party plugin. So it, it might not be available everywhere, but it is actually very popular. So you, you will, probably have access to wherever you might want to deploy this. It is still server-side encryption, so it is maybe doesn't actually fully satisfy the requirements if you want to do client-side encryption, but this is something you will find if you just look for column encryption. I have gotten a little bit of feedback on, on, on some concerns about PG Sodium. It is effectively a, a single person project and there have been some concerns about maybe the, the sort of pace and, and reliability of, uh, as to how bugs are addressed and things like that. So I, I, I'm not 
sure about that particular aspect, but that's some feedback I've received. Uh, but so obviously that's something you would need to check in before you deploy that. But it is actually kind of a cool thing to, so I, I would recommend checking that out if you're interested in this. And this is the thing that I'm working on. There's a, some of the hackers in the room know there's a patch I posted for this, but you know, this is how this could look if you built it into Postgres. So there's some new commands to make some keys. Don't need to go into the details of that, but it's a sort of two, two tier key structure. And then in the table definition, you make some, have some extra clause here to say encrypted, and then you can put all the properties in here, right? You obviously have to say what kind of key you want. And then here you could say, do you want deterministic? Do you want randomized? Maybe at some point homomorphic here, if we figure that out, that would be a place to put it. There's also clauses here to set the encryption method. And then, so that's where that would go. So if it's a patch I have, but it is kind of stuck on a couple of things. One is the, encryption method issue that I talked about. The other is unrelated to this patch, but it needs protocol changes. And that's uh, kind of a, someone is chuckling up here. Yes, that's a that's a challenge in, in Postgres development at the moment that we're trying to figure out how we can make protocol changes in a safe, deliberate manner. So those are the main, just for the hackers in the room that are curious where this is stuck, those two things basically. So ideally this, well, the idea is, as I'm leading to this, it's all very complicated and there's so many options and things you need to think about. Ideally, this makes it easier. That's what I'm hoping for. Ideally, you need, don't need to make any client code changes because it's all just this. This is all you need to do. And the client, the application code doesn't need to know about this at all. It's all in the PQ or you know in, in, in the driver. Okay. Yeah, but the, yeah, I mentioned some of the problems needs work in drivers and it's not done yet. And there's also a couple other things I, that are unclear, these last ones, right? You can't do any, if it's encrypted before it hits the wire, you can't do any encoding conversion. It's maybe a less important problem nowadays if you just have so UTF-8 on both sides, that's okay. It doesn't enforce any data types on the server, right? So in, in if you just, in, if, if you say your column is an integer, you encrypt it on the client, the server doesn't, can't actually verify that it's really an integer. It just has to trust that. It's, it's a possible objection. It's probably not actually important in practice because there's, you can't do anything wrong with that. So. And you also, and this is again, a sort of more subtle, subtle problem for implementers of, of drivers and so on. You can't, in, in the Postgres protocol, you can send data in text or binary formats. But if you encrypt it before it hits the wire, you can't do that. So the way I've implemented it is that it's just text format that's encrypted. If you have a driver that wants binary, that it, it's not gonna work together. So those are also some, I mean, there's no solutions to the things in the last row, that's just the way it is. Quick, one slide about key management, I could talk all day about this. Um, so I kind of glossed over this in, in the various example. There's always like key somewhere, right? Get a key. The key is just a, a sequence of bits technically. So you get your key any way you want. But in practice, you want to have key management. So you know, well, first of all, you don't want to just have the key sitting there in plain text. You want to get it from some secure storage. You also want to, that's the M, the management of keys. You want to expire keys at some point, you want to rotate keys. You want to add keys and remove keys in some kind of deliberate process that is possibly audited and so on and so on. So you need some kind of integration into, you know, let's say we put this code that I'm proposing in here in libpq. There needs to be code that talks to a key management system. And key management systems are is software that's enterprise software that is out there, there's many vendors and solutions for those. And 
a lot of you who are maybe working in organizations past a certain size will have one already. And ideally, then any solution like this would also interact with that, but they're all different. So integrations would have to be built for each one of them. So that's just a thing that has to be done. Right? So it's, and there is, there is a, there is a protocol called uh, KMIP, Key Management Interoper Interoperability Protocol, which sounds good, but let me tell you from practical experience, it doesn't, it's not interoperable. It's, it's, a, it's a protocol, but it's not interoperable. So, yeah. so that's just the thing, every time you have to think about these encryption topics, this one or any other one in Postgres, you know, TDE, for example, you need to have these integrations with the key management system and they have to be done separately for each one of them. Right. Yeah, this is sort of part of key management. Do you want to key rotation is all is is a thing that is part of requirements usually. You have to rotate your key every two years or something like that. This is always part of the requirements, and so you have to provide that in your solution. Nobody actually ever does it but you have to at least tell them that you can do it. All right, so the way I have sort of set it up is a two T architecture. I just mentioned that it's easier to rotate the master key because the master key just encrypts the second key. So that's easier. If you want to rotate the actual encryption key, then you have to rewrite your whole table. So we want to support both of these, but the second one is just going to be a, a heavy operation. So to satisfy the key rotation requirement, you usually just want to rotate the master key. This is pretty standard. This is not something you know I came up with or, or you know a few of us here in Postgres land came up with. This is pretty standard. If you have disk encryption on, on laptops, it kind of works the same way. Right? So if you change your encrypt disk encryption password on, on, on your laptop, that basically changes the master key, but there's a bunch of other keys below that that are not changing, because then you would have to rewrite your same disk. So a similar system would be provided here. All right, so yeah, I have a little bit of time. So here's some other ideas that sort of come up with in this topic space. There's hardware, there's a piece of hardware or kind of hardware called a secure enclave. We, and the idea there is that you can load, on, this would be on your database server, for example, and then you can load the encrypted data into the secure enclave, the secure enclave can then unencrypt it, but it stays in that secure space. Then you can do some computations, allegedly. So you can kind of do the, the you know, look up encrypted values kind of operation or operate on encrypted values because the secure enclave kind of keeps it in this enclave. That sounds good. Right, but this is also, I think, in practice, has been sort of shown to be insecure. These pieces of hardware are, they have been sort of shown insecure on this level that people do nowadays, right? How you sort of hack into CPUs by just sort of listening to their, the sounds they make as you compute things or to, you know, measure the temperature and things like that. On this level, people can attack these secure enclaves as well. So I think this is a kind of a concept that's almost going away in my, uh, so of you, so that's not going to really do anything. The other thing that's interesting, and this is, I think, generally something maybe for version three, four, or five of this kind of thing, is we talked about how you can encrypt column values, protect them against, you know, reading them and you know, modifying them. But, uh, but what you can do is you can take encrypted values and swap them between rows. And so you can still make a mess of people's data that way. So the idea there would be to cryptographically tie an encrypted datum to the primary key of the column so that using some kind of signature, right, that kind of thing exists. And um, that is a thing I think that would be really useful. Obviously, it's, you know, more complications on protocol level and, and, and so on, but I think that could be done. Yeah, so 
some final caveats here to wrap it up. We can hide the data, but we can't hide the existence of data. Again, let's think about credit cards again. You have an online shop database, maybe that gets leaked. That's fine, right? You have your name and your encrypted credit card number. Okay, that leaks the existence that you have a credit card. It's probably not that bad, okay? But if you leak a medical database from the hospital and says there's all these names and they have some diagnosis here that's encrypted, that leaks data, right? Because you know that these people were in the hospital, they have a problem. So it doesn't fix that. You can hide the actual data, but not the existence of data. You can't hide the length of the values. I talked about that. And the final point here is maybe this is sometimes a misunderstanding of this entire topic. This is not necessarily, or it can't really protect against a sort of malicious or evil admin or DBA. It can help a little bit, right? Defense in depth. But it's not really the real point. The point is more that the DBA doesn't want the data because then they're responsible for it. You don't want it on the server so it doesn't leak into backups and, and because of requirements and so on. But it, it's not, if you have an adversarial relationship with your database, then there's probably other problems that need to be addressed. So this is the wrong way of thinking about that, okay? All right. So again, I, I said I, I will leave with more questions and answers. Um, advice for the moment, you know, look for things that are mature and in and, and general and, and are clear, you know, to you. Don't necessarily believe hypes of third party products without doing your proper evaluation. I mentioned PG crypto is almost always the wrong solution. Homomorphic encryption is dubious. Yes, and I, you know, welcome feedback on your use cases. So you're sort of you know, Postgres hacker on, on, on sort of my actual work, but also just, you know, use cases so we can you know, sort of collate those and then hopefully come to a, an easier solution at some point in the future. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll be here for a bit if people have individual questions. Thanks.